uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Hebarov Ezza to this uh, very, very well assorted and rich uh, public that we have today. Uh, and I hope the same would be with the, with the YouTube crowd that <laughs> we'll tune in later. Uh, and uh, I have to say that, um, uh, you know, um, it's very easy also to, to, to summarize this, this very rich bio of uh, Dr. Heba because, because she's not only uh, a stellar scholar who um, has been uh, teaching and, and doing research in Cairo, both Cairo University and the uh, American University in Cairo, um, and the LSE, the London School of Economics, and now at Ibn Khaldun University uh, in Istanbul, but she's also a uh, a, a real, really prominent uh, and public intellectual, uh, not just in the Middle East, but globally. So um, she's the author of so many important publications uh, in English and in Arabic. I, I hope that uh, anyone in English would be a chapter for the uh, previously mentioned Oxford Handbook of the Sociology of Islam. We are still waiting for a couple of chapters. Those that are listed online in the in the link that I uh, posted on the chat are like 37 or 38, but a few more are coming. Um, but the impact of uh, Dr. Heba on uh, in tremendous uh, because uh, her work um, um, has a very important uh, set of implications and is widely debated in leading uh, media outlets and among uh, intellectuals and citizens alike. Um, like a recent book on, on, on civility and Islam in Arabic, to which um, Al Jazeera dedicated a very long program, not so long ago, a beautiful one, uh, interviewing Dr. Heba and many leading personalities and scholars uh, from the Arab world who commented on the book. So, um, welcome, welcome, Dr. Heba, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, it's a pleasure indeed to be here today. And uh, I will be uh, listening also before I talk to uh, Professor Saif Farid Atas. Of course, I learned a lot from him. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, thanking uh, Professor Armando as well for the invitation and Robert and, uh, and uh, uh, Jason for uh, running the, the full uh, technological uh, uh, platform. And um, uh, I, I just wanted to start by saying that uh, I have a very uh, uh, ambiguous relation with Ibn Khaldun, <laughs> that I taught him for many years at Cairo University uh, as part of uh, a course I used to teach uh, from Plato to NATO. So uh, basically the uh, history of political thought uh, across civilizations, including uh, uh, classics, uh, medieval ages, Islam, uh, uh, Christianity, of course, and, uh, and modern times. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, it was taught uh, from a political science perspective, from a classic political thought perspective, the main ideas, what is very uh, much related to uh, Asabiya and, uh, and Mulk and, and uh, all the notions that are related to politics, rise and fall of civilization, etc., cetera, and, and, and all the aspects also of some economic uh, dimensions and uh, the city and its emergence and its decay, etc. So uh, it was uh, uh, interesting for me to uh, think during the Arab Spring about um, uh, starting when I started realizing that the political uh, realm is, uh, is not uh, going as we wished uh, in the country. Uh, I thought that uh, the, the, the conflicts and the contestation between different uh, political groups were just you know, increasing. And I thought that how can we educate the public? So I started uh, thinking about teaching Al Muqaddima at uh, Sultan Hassan's mosque uh, in Cairo. And it's one of the oldest mosques. It's situated very close to the famous Muhammad Ali Citadel. And uh, I taught Ibn Khaldun for about six months, uh, from June 2013 till January 2014. So basically, uh, right before uh, we witnessed uh, the Take over of the army of the of the rule in Egypt. Democratic uh, um, the democratic scene was completely shattered with all its complications, of course. And uh, and I continued till it was banned. Basically, uh, in January 2014, the 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 the, 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 the basically it was in the mosque. It was banned. 
And, uh, and I uh, went to London School of Economics, uh, uh, had a lot of discussions as well on Ibn Khaldun with uh, the group at, uh, at uh, London School of Economics, the unit of um, uh, civil society and on conflicts, Mary Kaldur and the others. And Mary started introducing Ibn Khaldun to her own study of, uh, of uh, you know, some thoughts uh, introduced to uh, studying global civil society and understanding uh, some um, uh, thoughts coming from other areas. And then I decided to settle in Istanbul and then uh, I started looking for a job and I was offered uh, a job uh, in a new university. And when I asked the, uh, new, the rector who was uh, taking the initiative or the responsibility of establishing the new university, what is the name of the new university you want me to teach at? And he said, Ibn Khaldun. So I said, okay, this is very interesting. <laughs> and then I also wanted to teach Ibn Khaldun for the public in Istanbul. So I waited for an opportunity that was uh, similar to Sultan Hassan. And eventually our university managed to uh, have uh, access to uh, some um, madrasas around the Suleymaniyah Mosque uh, in Istanbul, which is one of the biggest mosques, of course. And uh, I started also teaching Ibn Khaldun to the public in Suleymaniyah. Uh, so um, it's a long story. So uh, Ibn Khaldun was accompanying me over many years. And uh, during these years, my also research agenda developed uh, uh, according to different factors. So my journey today uh, will be uh, to sort of stop at some ideas that Ibn Khaldun introduced regarding the tribe and how he imagined the world as a, as a normal, basically. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, accompany Ibn Khaldun to some of the uh, debates that are going on in sociology, something I started teaching at Ibn Khaldun University uh, in sociology department, which was an, an opportunity for me to go beyond the political that I was interested in and start comparing Ibn Khaldun to modern sociology in terms of notions like the tribe, the social bond, uh, the city, etc. So we, I started introducing to my students also uh, the modern sociological writings that that somehow relate to the notions that Ibn Khaldun introduced, though in a completely or fairly uh, different historical context. Um, I will. I, I was thinking about uh, Ibn Khaldun's understanding of the world because I also, uh, in my research agenda, I was very interested uh, because of the disappointment <laughs> regarding the ability of the project of Islamization of knowledge since the 80s to introduce something that is more comprehensive uh, regarding not only decolonial uh, uh, efforts in social sciences like uh, Professor Saif Farilat has mentioned, but also because uh, nothing substantial came out of it beyond uh, mostly the critique of uh, social sciences, which is interesting. And it was really sad uh, to see that nobody cared uh, to situate this in the critical uh, theory, uh, to, uh, to extend the boundaries of critical theory to include also critical views of modern uh, uh, sort of uh, critique of modern social sciences or decolonial, decolonializing uh, social sciences, but from uh, um, a different uh, perspective, uh, basically Islam. Neither of those who were responsible for the project of Islamization of knowledge actually were interested in that. They were addressing their own audience, uh, nor the critical uh, theory sort of, or critical voices within social sciences were interested in inviting them uh, maybe because of the Islamic uh, nature of their Weltanschauung uh, uh, or frame of reference, uh, basically. So uh, um, I started uh, teaching uh, that, and I wanted also to uh, combine my study of Ibn Khaldun with uh, an interest, as I said, in Nizam al-Alam. So Nizam al-Alam is the order of the world, in a way. This is how I coined it and started looking into it. Realizing that political science is a very limited uh, uh, science uh, uh, and, and that sociology and social theory is actually broader and that we can bring into the discussion of our understanding of how societies develop uh, different disciplines as well to enrich social, uh, to enrich political science uh, in, in, in particular. Uh, of course, the work that inspired me very much was The Normals of the Earth by uh, Carl Schmitt. Uh, in the Arab world, uh, his book, uh, Political Theology, and also uh, the concept of the political were translated, and they at attracted more attention. While I actually thought that uh, the norms of the earth is, uh, apart from its, its um, 
its historical aspect, the historical study uh, of Schmidt, but the, the conclusions and the insights that he offered are actually extremely important because he realized that uh, not alone did he try to uh, uh, um, and do some effort in defining the notion of nomos beyond the law or beyond the, the customs, the norms, different definitions in different writings are there, but also uh, because he realized uh, when he was talking from a juristic and legal uh, aspects of territory and, uh, and land, that also uh, this dimension is important in understanding social dynamics and in understanding socio-economic and socio-psychological and socio-political aspects. And he was talking about Ardnung uh, and Artung, how uh, the system is very much related to the nature of the territory and to the appropriation of land. And then also try to extend this to everyday life. And he wrote this at the very end of the book and I find uh, the chapter uh, where he tried to uh, extract some of these aspects of his understanding of uh, European uh, uh, public law or uh, the development of the uh, legal orders generally across uh, European history, uh, that he realized that this is also important to explain everyday life. And he based it on three dimensions as in his book, Appropriation, Distribution and Production. And uh, of course, this book was written early in the 20th century. And uh, as I'm very much interested as well in issues of globalization and, and urban sociology, I think that uh, we can take it further uh, to our understanding of how the spatial orders are being uh, changed and are being um, uh, developing in, in our world generally in a, in a moment of globalization. And this kept uh, sort of becoming one of my interests for some time. Uh, and I was at the very same time looking at what was going on in Egypt. So uh, I will start by introducing basically three quotes of Ibn Khaldun that I found interesting. Of course, some other quotes are there to extend the three ideas in uh, the Muqaddimah, but I just wanted to pick on that because of the limitation of time. And then we'll try to compare what he is saying and trying to see how he is imagining not only uh, how the rise and fall of civilizations or dynasties, but basically he had a vision of the, of the world. Uh, of course, his understanding of sciences is very important to look uh, into at, at the same time, but yani, I will just start focus on that. Um, one of the um, uh, sections in Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah that is usually overlooked because it's considered to be like when we overlook in our uh, different uh, uh, readings, you know, the, the introduction or the preface or the acknowledgement, you know, you just jump to chapter one. But I think that the, uh, the, the, the first uh, page of Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah uh, is very important. And I will, I will share um, um, my screen. Um, hold on for a second, please. So, of course, we, most of us who are familiar with, uh, with Ibn Khaldun know uh, this sort of wheel or circle uh, where he basically describes uh, how he thinks of the uh, uh, nomos, basically the law of, uh, of, the, of the rise and fall of, uh, not of the rise and fall, but the circle of rule, the circles of, govern of governance or the circle of how to understand society or uh, the social political condition, if you want to say so. And, uh, and here is my translation, uh, where he says that the world is a garden, the fence of which is the dynasty or the state. The dynasty is an authority through which life is given to the uh, Sunnah. He, in, there are some translations that say, uh, basically are given to the uh, customs, are given to the nature, are given to, but he said Sunnah, and I translate Sunnah as civility. Sunnah in terms of not the prophetic Sunnah, but the Sunnah of the uh, social, social norms and, uh, and accepted social norms, if you want to say so, and, and we can even consider it to be civility. The Sunnah civility is a way to handle matters governed by the ruler. The ruler is a regime 
supported by the soldiers. The soldiers are allies who are maintained by money. Money is sust sustenance brought together by subjects. The subjects are servants who are protected by justice. Justice is a norm and through it the world persists and the world, the world is a garden and then it starts again. Um, I think that, that this is a, a good beginning to understand how Ibn Khaldun basically sort of was, was considering the whole, how, to, how, how the system functions. But this is not, not all of it. I mean, this is the most famous one. I will start by the invocation that he uh, had, as I said, that is usually not, uh, uh, not usually uh, addressed in some writings. When he starts by setting the worldview, you know, uh, that there is for this world a creator, and hence the nomos is not only the social nomos, it's not the social order, it's not the, so the understanding of the, of, the, of the social laws, customs, rules, regulations, but also that, that it is about a wider cosmic sort of nomos. So he goes beyond, of course, the understanding of Schmidt uh, uh, that uh, when even in political theology he wanted to see the relation between the sovereign and sovereignty, it was within a specific historical, uh, historical frame. So uh, praise be God, he is powerful and mighty. In his hand, the, uh, he holds royal authority and kingship. Uh, I'm sorry, there are some mistakes here. Uh, his are the most beautiful names and attributes. His knowledge is such that nothing be uh, it revealed in secret, whispering or even uh, left unsaid, remains strange uh, to him. His power is such that nothing in heaven and upon earth is too much for him or escapes him. He, creates, uh, he created us from the earth as living, breathing creatures. He made us to settle on it uh, as races and nations. From it, he provided sustenance and provision for us. The wombs of our mothers and houses are our abode. Sustenance and food keep us alive. Time wears us out. Our life's final turns, the dates of which have been fixed for us in the book of destiny claims us. But he lasts and persists. He is the living one who does not die. I think this is like a, a very interesting and very well said summary of his ideas because he will keep in the Muqaddimah referring to, to these dimensions. And, and those who read al Muqaddimah will notice that every time he finishes a section, he basically mentions God in relevance, the attribute of Allah that is relevant to what he was saying. So if he's talking about economy and different professions, he would say al-Razzaq, uh, al-Baqi, or whatever. And if he to is talking about uh, the rise and fall of civilizations or rise and fall of dynasties, he would say, you know, that he is the only one who remains after everything, you know, uh, is 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 uh, null uh, and etc. So in in the it's not like Bismillah. It's not just the start and then he starts writing his book. No, it's actually the vision through which he is writing his books, even when he talks about his own understanding of history, et cetera. The second thing in his understanding of how we can think is uh, when he talks about the nature of civilization in, in, in uh, the section in chapter one, and then he says it should be known that history is in matter of fact is information about human social organization, which itself is identified with world civilization. So it's, and then he will, he will speak of history as philosophy. It deals with such conditions affecting the nature of civilization as for instance, savagery and sociability, group feelings, and the different ways by which one group of human beings achieves uh, superiority over another. Uh, it deals with royal authority and the dynasties that result in, the, in this manner and with the various ranks that exist within them. It further deals with the different kinds of gainful occupations and ways of making a living with the sciences and crafts that human beings pursue as part of their activities and efforts and with all the other institutions that originate in civilization through its very nature. So this is in chapter one as if it's the first, the first section is basically mapping the, his understanding of the, not the cosmic, but basically the social and political order. And then he moves to an understanding specifically uh, of the political, when he says that uh, when mankind has achieved social organizations, uh, as we have stated, and when civilization in the world has thus become a fact, people need some someone to exercise very Hobbesian here to exercise a restraining influence and keep them apart for aggressiveness and injustice all in the animal nature of man. So here we have some insights into uh, also uh, rising uh, interest in the animality, in sociology, animality, and humanity 
uh, reason and instincts, uh, uh, desire and uh, and the rationality, you know. So he also mentioned, uh, mentioned this. And I think that uh, these dimensions uh, forward the understanding uh, of uh, how this functions and basically the notion of Asabiya and lineage was the basic, uh, the basic thread that he took. And then uh, one last section that I think is very important, uh, and I did my following uh, presentation on, is when he talked about religion and asabi. And this uh, paragraph is actually a, a very important paragraph because though asabi and religion are very important for the establishment of dynasties, according to him, he realized that they are not enough, which helps us understand the limitations of lineage and the limitations of religion. Okay, so there are limitations and transformations, configurations. So, yani, quoting Talal Asad or, or, or uh, the, the whole debate about secularism in our modern times, you know, that religion basically has got different uh, formation uh, factors and, and that also the religious experience comes into that from a sociological anthropological dimension. And he says something very important that is relating the dynasties with the nature of religiosity. When he says, when a dynasty is firmly established, it can dispense of group feelings. So here he's saying that the system and the regime, though it is established on asabiya, on lineage, but actually when it is a system, it becomes like uh, establishing its own routine. And establishing the routine uh, effectively makes people dependent on the system, on the political system. The reason for this is that people find it difficult to submit to large dynastic power at the beginning, unless they are forced into submission by strong superiority, the new government. But of course, as we know, governments have to deliver. It's something strange, is something strange for them at the beginning. People are not familiar with or used to its rule. But once leadership is firmly vested in the members of the family qualified to exercise royal authority in the dynasty, and once royal authority has been passed on by inheritance over many generations and through successive dynasties, the beginnings are forgotten and the members of that family are clearly marked as leaders. It, is it, it has become a firmly established article of faith. And in the Arabic text actually of Ibn Khaldun, the, the language is very beautiful. Uh, so he said it, it becomes uh, firmly established as an article of faith that one must be subvert, subvert, uh, subservient and submissive to them. People will fight with them in their behalf. He, he, here in Arabic, it says, وَرَسَخَ فِي الْعَقَائِدِ دِينُ الْإِنْقِيَادِ And in, the translation actually is, and in the, in the faith, the, the submission became a religion. So it's, it's very interesting as, as, as he says this in Arabic. وَرَسَخَ فِي الْعَقَائِدِ دِينُ الْإِنْقِيَادِ and it is a very important notion of, of social psychology in terms of religion and politics, actually. It's like how people eventually give into the system. And then he says, people will fight with them in, the, in their behalf as they would fight for the articles of faith. So it basically becomes a religion. Politics becomes, or the rule becomes like a faith. And Annie, we can relate that also to uh, Schmidt uh, to some degree. By this time, the rulers will not need much group feeling to maintain their power. It is as if obedience to the government were a divinely revealed book that cannot be changed or opposed. It is for some good reason that the discussion of the imamate is placed at the end of works dealing with the articles of faith as if it were one of them. And this is, of course, a, a critique. We, we have long stories about how this happened, you know, because of the impact of the Shia, the Sunnah started adding it to the articles of faith or what. But, uh, but, but this section is very important. Uh, the second part of my uh, flow of thought or thinking for today's presentation was actually when I was reading this, at the very same time, other uh, insights came uh, to me from uh, different uh, uh, sociologists, sociological readings uh, on top of Ibn Khaldun. And I started realizing that it's important as much as Charles Tilly uh, worked on the city in history or the city in European history. You know, it's important to see the history and realize that the, the, there has been a lot of alterations. Uh, but reading the, the, the type of society that he is describing is important because it's not vanished. 
Um, can you all see the, the, the script? There is a question here that says we cannot see the script. Okay. Uh, so um, the the aspects that I think are related to uh, what Ibn Khaldun was uh, discussing relate very much uh, to um, how to understand different layers of the nomos, how to understand uh, his understanding or his vision of the cosmic. No, nomos and then a socio-political nomos and then a nomos related to how people behave and how people behave in different circumstances under which conditions under which systems and how the order of uh, the spatial order and the, the 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 ruling order is important for understanding the the behavior of people as well something that will bring us to uh, different uh, sociologists uh, to uh, contribute to this discussion um, when I was looking into his understanding of the city and how also uh, at one point, because of the lack of Asabiya, uh, the rulers uh, start uh, asking for uh, help of mercenaries. Uh, it was interesting to see how uh, at that historical time, it was very common and uh, there are different uh, uh, studies on that. Uh, at that point, some uh, North African uh, uh, rulers were basically seeking the help of mercenaries uh, from the uh, Christian Europe. And, uh, and uh, it based somehow a relation between, though very complicated relation, but the relation between North Africa and Europe at the time. And uh, also it will remind us uh, when you read and, and, and look into that and then think, oh, Libya, interesting. <laughs> so uh, we have also uh, help in the Arab world today uh, by the tribes and by the different tribes, you know, the different notions of tribes, ruling tribes or tribes in terms of tribes, seriously, you know, at all wars where tribes are engaged, uh, we, we find the role of mercenaries, though the configuration and the relation and trajectories are different. But it's very interesting to see how uh, the, the, the existence of mercenaries at that time in North Africa, and uh, to some extent also uh, in, in a different way, during the Mamluk era, um, we can't really call them mercenaries like, uh, uh, like it's, it's different a bit, but, uh, but at the end of the day, we have such groups, we have such uh, uh, gendarmes, uh, if we can call them so, who are engaged in the political realm uh, in, a, in a way that is not uh, usually consistent with the original uh, uh, source of power or legitimacy of the, of the regime. Uh, let alone its existence now in our own uh, uh, political scenes, uh, when we have uh, increasingly an acknowledgement of the existence of uh, private military companies, and after being, uh, after having a treaty, actually an international treaty against uh, dealing with mercenaries and hiring them, uh, we started having uh, more and more acknowledgement, uh, 2008, 2012, uh, Montreux uh, agreement and other uh, agreements started introducing uh, the mercenaries and actually giving legacy to, to practices that have been there since uh, Blackwater appeared on the scene in Iraq uh, since 2003. And then, you know, we started in social sciences trying to figure out how can we deal with this phenomena. And now the phenomena is basically getting bigger and bigger. And uh, recently, a few weeks ago, the Saudi government uh, assigned uh, or, or assigned a, a huge amount of money, billions, uh, in cooperation with uh, with the uh, private military companies, and this has been going on. I mean, at least the royal uh, the royal uh, house has been uh, using uh, Blackwater for security for some time, uh, especially since uh, MBS uh, took over. So uh, it's very interesting uh, how how we can see uh, what Ibn Khaldun is is mentioning and the manifestations of such relations, but in our times in different uh, in, in different much more altered. Uh, circumstances. Uh, there is also the dimension of the city that uh, as much as the Professor Said Farid Al-Attas mentioned that Ibn Khaldun thought of the city as a small, small world, you know, as a small nomos. <laughs> and, uh, and he described, you know, how the city uh, emerges, how it's, uh, it's ruled, how it's governed, the different uh, activities, the, 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 the type of buildings, how people uh, interact from Bedouin uh, um, uh, areas uh, with the city, whether they settle, uh, the relation between the tribe and the city, the city is not like uh, 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 the city also includes people who belong to tribes. The tribal lineage was there all the time. 
and is still present in our Arab world today. So it's very interesting to see how uh, how this world actually that uh, he described this world of the city, uh, the walled city, the normos of man, uh, according to the analysis of Jacques uh, Elul from a more Christian background, um, is now being sort of transformed completely. And to which extent we can uh, we can use our understanding of Ibn Khaldun and develop it further uh, to to see uh, the relations in in modern and global uh, cities. Uh, Saskia Sassen's uh, work has been very inspiring, as much as the work of Armando Salvatore and others. But what also uh, made me try to bring some ideas from Ibn Khaldun, not necessarily apply them, but take them along while looking at what is going on in the urban scene uh, in the Arab world today, was actually, interestingly, some work of architects. Because it introduced me to uh, this, the spatial dimension, not the territorial dimension. Of course, the territorial dimension and the systems of, of sovereignty, as described by uh, scholars like uh, John Agnew and others who are more interested in uh, historical development of spatial orders, etc., but from a more sort of uh, foreign uh, sort of uh, international relations perspective as well. It's interesting that uh, the, there was an absence of, uh, of uh, uh, following up uh, the scene of architecture Though architecture in some countries is not considered part of engineering, they have their own school of architecture. And uh, I started uh, finding the work of, uh, after trying to see the sort of comprehensive and complex understanding of Ibn Khaldun of the Nomos, uh, I found the work of, uh, of, a, of a German uh, architect, uh, Frei Otto, uh, uh, is very important. Uh, he, 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 his work actually is, uh, is uh, uh, focusing more on, uh, on uh, connectedness and uh, also on uh, uh, trying to see the world uh, of, of urban uh, texture and urban, uh, uh, urban uh, planning as very much related to nature. And uh, drawing on Ibn Khaldun again, seeing the different nomoi as related to each other. Uh, Carol Crumley, uh, also from uh, um, one of the sociologists who was interested in historical ecology uh, and the notion of heter heterarchy rather than hierarchy. And uh, through her study of uh, archaeology, uh, she tried to see the complex relation between uh, heterarchy and hierarchy. And also the fact that we did not actually move historically from the tribe to the city to the uh, modern uh, modern uh, uh, urban formations, but rather they are going along <laughs> each other and they are still existing. And sometimes we, we fall into uh, the, the old, uh, the old uh, social formations uh, at, a, at a critical point, they take over. And the two examples that we can uh, look into in our modern times is Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, uh, the work of uh, Akbar Ahmed early uh, uh, during the invasion of uh, the Americans to uh, Afghanistan, after a few years, he started developing his idea that actually the invasion of the Americans empowered the tribe. Uh, he has a very interesting book titled uh, The Thistle and the Drone, where actually he is trying to see how the, the, the tribe developed under un, uh, during that war with, with, the, with the Americans and how it became actually stronger. And the scene that we saw after the withdrawal, the withdrawal of the Americans from Afghanistan, it is definitely chaotic, but far less chaotic than expected. So it's very interesting how the tribe is, is still intact uh, in different uh, countries, even if in some countries like the Gulf states, for example, it has different uh, alliances and different manifestations of power and, and even use of its own uh, capital, etc. Also, I think that the work of Ibn Khaldun is, uh, is very relevant to understanding, trying to, to relate it to the uh, previous understanding of the Islamic city. So he described the cities and he described the tribal and uh, the sedentary and the, and the Bedouin in North Africa at, at one point and the Arabs and, and the Berber there. But there are previously also different studies and, and I have to mention here the, the, the yeah, uh, that I owe a lot to uh, to uh, uh, to the to do, again to the architects Hazen Ziada, a professor of uh, archi architecture and urban planning, actually introduced me uh, to this uh, through uh, his writings on Al Madina, and also on the understanding of the city in the Quran. And I think that we cannot understand 
Ibn Khaldun uh, alone in, un in order to understand the Arab and Islamic society and, uh, and what, uh, what is related to power and, uh, and um, uh, uh, networks of trust. Uh, again, back to uh, Charles Tilly. So, uh, and to Armando Salvatore when he is describing uh, civility and, uh, and uh, the networks of solidarity and the networks of trust. Uh, this is very important because it, it takes us further to, uh, to a holistic perspective of the, of the ecumen, like uh, uh, Armando Salvatore uh, uh, contributed in his writings. But I think that it's not enough because again, the ecumen is, 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 is a territorial notion, even if the social networks are highlighted. But I think that the urban uh, and the spatial is a different level of analysis and it should be introduced. And this is something that I uh, also find uh, uh, some uh, writings and, and some um, um, contributions that I have to uh, refer to as well. Um, I find the work, for example, of, uh, uh, of Simon, um, Simon Mabin. He wrote a fantastic piece relating the notions of nomos uh, be between uh, Karl Schmidt, uh, Hannah Arendt, Agamben, and he introduced also uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, as well. Uh, but the, the notion was basically, again, territorial. And I think that the urban and the urban scene and the urban sociology uh, developments uh, in, in theoretical terms are very important to include because this, this will bring us to the city as a center and as a hub. Uh, back to Charles Tilly, when he mentioned that actually the relation between the city and the state is very complicated. And we have different uh, configurations uh, here. And sometimes the city takes over the state. If a specific city has its own assets, has its own power, has its own intellectual, uh, uh, intellectual uh, 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 power as well, it takes over uh, the state uh, in, dif in different ways. And, and in the case of historical uh, uh, investigation and examination, uh, he gives different examples. Uh, what, what all of that uh, uh, represents is actually a very complicated uh, picture of what started as a very uh, simple description of a specific historical era uh, and specific trajectories. And uh, I think that uh, uh, if we move from that to the third part of my presentation, uh, uh, I can't mention all the, all the literature that I, I think is important to, uh, to add to our understanding of the nomos and, uh, and the different layers, etc. I move to how uh, all of that uh, was, uh, uh, was very useful for me to try to figure out what is going on in Egypt today. So uh, though, uh, uh, yeah, of course, before that, uh, I, I should also mention the tribal dimension of the neo-nomadism neo and neo-tribalism. Mafisoli is an example, but also very important to mention without giving time for that, there is no time. But uh, uh, I think that the nomadology of uh, Deleuze is very important to add. Many of his insights amazingly uh, overlap with uh, the Khaldunian uh, notion of nomadism. And it brings it to a very high uh, philosophical uh, level. And also it relates us to the war machine. Uh, and I think that th this work is very important as well. What happened in the case of Egypt? Uh, I will show you uh, some pictures uh, that uh, highlight what happened and why we need the Khaldunian uh, sociology, but also we need to take it along with, that, with us to new horizons uh, uh, and, and to new uh, sort of levels of, uh, of meaning that are uh, uh, now being... Um, um, I will share my screen again. That are developing. And this is like a very practical way of looking at things to, to see it uh, on, the, on the screen. So um, this is Tahrir Square during the Arab uprising. And this is Tahrir Square after the coup after the coup and, and recently, I mean, this was recently, at the beginning, there was a big uh, 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 flag uh, after the coup, 2013. And then uh, they put uh, two years, a year ago, uh, almost the, the, um, um, the this iconic sort of pharaonic uh, uh, obelisk. And uh, if you know Tahrir Square well, uh, if this is taken 
it's actually taken from my balcony <laughs> uh, by my daughter uh, because I live on Tahrir Square originally. Uh, this was taken January 2000 and, uh, 2021. So it was taken a few months ago. And interestingly enough, this was taken Thursday at one o'clock. And I, again, owe uh, Hazim Ziada uh, a lot when he introduced me to the notions of uh, de-densification in urban sociology and urban planning, uh, like uh, the work of Colin McFarlane and others. Uh, to explain this to me, this was impossible uh, uh, five, six years ago, you know, uh, to see this uh, degree of de-densification of Tahrir Square, but there are many reasons. Reasons that Ibn Khaldun wouldn't have thought about. Like, for example, removing uh, uh, specific official buildings uh, from, uh, from the square to the new capital. Establishing a new capital basically de-densified the areas where the bureaucratic apparatus of the state was very dense like Tahrir Square and around it. At the back of this big building on Tahrir Square, we also have different uh, uh, ministries, Minister of, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health and others. So the de-densification is a key word and also the establishment of a new city. He, didn't, he never thought, Ibn Khaldun, that actually we would, would reach a point where cities can be established from scratch as full cities, not develop as small cities and then grow and then become hubs and uh, sort of centers of civilization. But establishing a full city from scratch uh, did not occur, occur to him, I think. Uh, and this is why this de-densification actually took place. Uh, the Arab Spring was about masses, not only geographical and geospatial mass in terms of the speciality, in terms of materiality, phys physical dimension, but people. And there was a need to actually de-densify the central areas in the city and then move to a completely different uh, city. This is the new capital uh, that looks very much like Dubai. This is also a very interesting thing that not only do the people who are uh, suffering from the invasion of the, of the victor uh, submit to his culture, but some, sometimes we imitate cultures that have a different uh, economic uh, system like the imitation of Dubai, taking Dubai as an example. It's something that is, is, is very interesting, not only the clothes, the language, but also the, the urban planning. And this is uh, the presidential palace. I will come to this later because this is another presidential palace in Alamein, another city that is being built now. Uh, and this is the presidential palace in the new capital that is being built in Egypt. Uh, and then we move to this uh, uh, interesting um, uh, minister, Ministry of Defense in the new capital. So here you have uh, a segregated, uh, almost like the Qata'a in, uh, in, 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 in Egypt, when uh, there was a, a basically a military, a, a sort of military sort of space, urban space uh, in the city. And here we have the uh, pharaonic, uh, iconic uh, sort of um, uh, panoramic uh, branding of the new city. And I will come to that as well. Of course, the biggest mosque, the biggest church, everything is big, everything is huge. And all of that took place within, a, within almost uh, less than seven, eight years. Uh, this is going to be the business sector in the, the business uh, area in the, in the new capital. Uh, again, the imitation uh, in, the, uh, in the urban design. And this is another city, which is Al Alamein, uh, being built now uh, in the old uh, classic Alamein area. And this is when it was barely being uh, uh, under construction and uh, Jennifer Lopez, for the sake of branding, came and uh, uh, there was a big uh, show by Jennifer Lopez 2019, while the city is still like that. I mean, it's not even uh, fully uh, constructed, uh, but branding and marketing is also something that, that Ibn Khaldun never thought about, that how can you, brand, how can you turn cities into, into commodities? So uh, this is very interesting. This is New Mansoura. We are having, I will show you a map uh, in a moment. We are having the establishment of new cities all across the country to double the, uh, uh, the built uh, uh, spaces in the country within almost 20 years to come. So uh, now we have also new Mansoura uh, in the north of the Delta, 
We have Al Jalala city. This is uh, situated close to Suez Canal. And I mentioned here also Aswan, New Aswan, and many other cities across the country being established to basically uh, um, give us a sense of hit, uh, uh, um, polycentrism. Polycentrism within the city and polycentrism across the different cities. And so we have, uh, we have a new type of governance emerging, not because of Asabia, but because of urban uh, design and urban uh, new urban uh, fabric added uh, and, and new cities being built. Uh, we also have the dimension of the uh, uh, pharaonic, the ancient Egyptian history, uh, becoming very visible uh, in all the visual uh, language, the visual narrative of the new buildings. Here is the new uh, museum, Egyptian museum, that will be opened uh, soon, uh, close to the pyramids. And we also uh, have a, a reinvention or um, regeneration of the city and it's called regeneration usually is referring to when the city has areas that are not used properly you know like old uh, industrial areas that are not functioning and you want to regenerate uh, and uh, restructure the city or uh, urban planning but these areas that are in the plan this is still going on this is just a maquette for it uh, these areas were populated by hundreds of thousands of people who are now being evacuated and, uh, and again, uh, uh, a city is on the way that is called, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's a city that will be uh, uh, called uh, Tutera uh, that is now go going, we don't know where it's, they are going to build it. There is now a promotion for the city and it's gonna be uh, in the image of a pyramid, the city in the image of a pyramid. So again, also the connotations and the cultural identi identity issues. I will try to be very brief to finish so that where, how can we take Ibn Khaldun to this and what, is the, what are the commonalities? Here we have a map of Egypt where you will find the, in orange, the new urban spaces that have been built in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, six, seven years. So you have new Alamein city, uh, new Burg al Arab, new Alexandria, new Mansoura, new Rashid, new Delta, new administrative capital. Uh, and then you have new Menia, new Asyut, uh, new Suhag, new Akhmim, new Kena, and new Aswan. Okay, so these cities basically not only lead to uh, expansion, which is good, why not? You know, if you can establish new neighborhoods and, and, and call them cities, big areas, gated communities. But the problem is that if you think from a political economy perspective, who is going to sort of uh, um, buy uh, pieces of land in these uh, areas, they are basically the rich people of each and every area. So you are practicing in a, in a great, we are witnessing in a great deal urban segregation. So it looks like urban development, it looks like establishing new urban spaces, new cities, but it is basically uh, a degree of uh, urban segregation. Uh, not only that, it includes also a military aspect. So uh, these are, this is a timeline for the new, uh, uh, the new uh, urban communities in Egypt. We didn't have new urban communities 1960, 1970, 77, we started having generation one, and then we started having generation two. You have uh, um, uh, Sadat city, we had al Abur city, we had others, and then we had generation three, small cities where they did not attract many people. In the 80s, I think 6 October also, started growing as a suburb and then it grew now into a city. But at the same time, we have a new Burg al Arab and new Burg al Arab airport. We have uh, an expansion of airports to serve these new regions. So we are shifting to a regional. So it's not only about building a city, it's about changing the way of governance. We are shifting the nature of the map of a country and military bases along. So every city has got a, a re, is part of a region and every region has got an airport and has got a military base. This is very interesting because it, it shows how we can have different maps uh, uh, other than what we uh, used to do, uh, used to know, okay? It's even shifting, it's not about the city, it's about governance, new nodal governance in a way, uh, regional and nodal. And I want here to finish with a reflection on Cairo as a city, 
uh, from that perspective and uh, say that uh, the notion of the city or the urban development is important but what also is very important is like uh, Armando mentioned very quickly in his in his uh, introduction but what which was very important as well which is speed so uh, connectivity and circulation and speed and the issues of solidarity networks will be destroyed by such um, allocation appropriation distribution and production of space not of assets not of power but of space itself the space itself and the land becomes the subject of production and distribution of course and appropriation and uh, the traffic uh, development of traffic in the city is actually something that i don't think that uh, was uh, discussed earlier uh, with the same uh, with the same uh, depth and uh, actually we have now according to traffic in cairo four layers of the city. So layered city was basically a term that was used to describe layered city in terms of classes. But these classes lived next to each other, usually in the, in the, in the urban texture, in the urban and social texture. But the layers that we have, we have the ability to have, we have now in, in different cities, but not in Cairo yet, but soon, soon we, have, uh, we have Uber copters. So in the city, even the, the, the airspace you know, will be used as a layer of the city. And the, the, the roof, the top roofs of the different new buildings, specifically in the new capital and other new cities, in the big iconic uh, skyscrapers, will, will have also a space for helicopters. So you have the air, and then you have the monorail. There is a big project of monorail uh, 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 in Egypt to, to link the new uh, capital to Cairo, and then to 6 October, and then take it from there, you have also a, a railway going to Al Alamein. So basically linking the new cities, but you have also the layer of the monorail and then the layer of the railways and then the underground. There is a huge expansion in the underground network and lines in, in specifically in Cairo. And now it's starting to, to be the same in Alexandria as well. So this type of layering includes as well layering of not only connectivity, but also control of circulation and hence speed comes in as as speed itself as an asset of appropriation and distribution and production so if we want to imagine the city in such a very mul mul multiplied way very complex layers and layers of the city uh, and then layers of the cities in a texture of the whole country and then what type of politics can result from that, but what is more important for me personally, what type of, what type of resistance? So what type of resistance needs to be developed in order to reestablish solidarity networks and, and uh, networks of, of trust, and also grant the right, not to the city, but to the country, to the land of the country. And we can talk more about, uh, about uh, some political issues like Tiran and Sanafir, you know, the two islands that were uh, graciously uh, uh, considered uh, not Egyptian anymore and given handed to Saudi Arabia and other uh, dimensions of how the city and appropriation of land is not a matter of territoriality and legal norms. It's not about uh, it's not about this the, the, the land. It's also about the spatial multiplied levels of the human condition with additional digitalization and uh, securitization. Um, I have a lot to say about what uh, Ibn Khaldun actually uh, contributes to further development of our ideas if we take him along and if we see that, that his limitations. By seeing the limitations, we see the horizons. And this is why I think we, we need Ibn Khaldun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heba. There is a 